Okay, good morning. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to the ALD Connect Bootcamp. From behalf of ALD Connect, we would like to thank you for participating in this session. Dr. Troy Lund and I will be presenting about cerebral ALD considerations for men with AMN. Um, please note that this webinar is for informational purposes only. This discussion is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. If you or a family member are ill or suspect that you are ill, seek professional medical attention immediately. ALD Connect does not recommend or endorse any specific physicians, treatments, procedures, or products, even though they may be mentioned on this webinar. Dr. Lund, first, I will turn it over to you. Okay, thanks, Aaron. All right, I will share my screen here. I have a few slides uh, I'm going to discuss with the audience today. There we go. Hopefully you can see my slides. All right, so this is a Men with AMN Bootcamp. My uh, title this time is uh, Transplant 102 as opposed to Transplant 101, uh, which I talked about last time for the children. So transplant uh, of men with cerebral disease uh, is is completely different actually. So I'm just gonna touch on some of the high points. Unlike uh, the children, um, there, there are very few uh, scientific publications and descriptions of transplant outcomes in men, but there are a couple that we can uh, discuss briefly. Let's see, advance here. All right, what is the goal again? As a reminder, um, this is a brain with gadolinium enhancement uh, shown here. This is the garland ring of enhancement pre-transplant in a person with cerebral ALD. 30 days after transplant, it is completely resolved and gone. You, you don't see that ring anymore and uh, it does not come back after transplant. So that's always the goal is the rest of the inflammatory process in cerebral disease. Now the uh, cerebral brain injury, this is a, a different uh, form of imaging and this shows us the injury that's taking place here in the corpus callosum. Uh, this doesn't go away, this injury stays with you. Um, and so what is done is done. And um, that's why going to transplant as early as possible, whether it's for a child or, or a man uh, is vital. So I, a lot of what I'm going to describe really comes out of the um, German um, description of transplants for men as they put together uh, their group of men and published it in a couple of articles over the last uh, two years. And so uh, this is by Jorn Kuhl. And um, uh, I think that's the best data we have to go on. And, and our own experience is very similar to theirs. Um, so they really described um, the transplantation in, in only about 12 to 14 men at the time. Uh, and this is the table of the men that um, they transplant, what they described the outcomes. You can see the ID, you can see the age of transplant varied from the 20s to uh, 40s. Um, there's an EDSS score, which I'll discuss in a bit whether the person had Addison's disease, MRI pattern, the less score, um, which we talk about a lot in children, and then the clinical symptoms. Um, there are a variety of different symptoms that people had, bladder dysfunction, ataxia, Addison's, uh, learning difficulties, et cetera. Um, so this just describes uh, their patients uh, uh, that they're gonna tell us about. Uh, and, these, and the second table is really just the transplant characteristics, uh, more important to me than the audience probably, um, but that shows our conditioning regimen, uh, which is usually myeloblative versus a reduced intensity. The donor source, uh, MSD is matched sibling donor, uh, still the gold standard treatment. Uh, sometimes an unrelated donor was used um, um, or a matched unrelated donor. Um, 
And in this case, uh, they, it looks like they use UD as a, a, a surrogate for cord blood donor, which um, we do as well. They looked at donor chimerism, described any GVH, any infection, other neurologic toxicities, and then the outcome, who, who's, al who's alive and, and who died. Um, so the one thing I wanted to briefly touch on is the ADSS, Expanded Disability Data Scale. Uh, this uh, portend, uh, portends itself more to our assessment of adults prior to transplant uh, because of the excellent work from our German colleagues, uh, less so to children. Um, uh, this is one component of the, of the scale. I'm, I'm by no means an expert on the scale. There are other components to this, but essentially it's how well you're moving around and it ranges from zero to 10 with um, death uh, being number 10. And the scales really developed uh, for assessment of those with multiple sclerosis, but we've adapted it for men with cerebral ALD. <coughs> an, <coughs> an important cutoff is really the score of seven. So seven and higher is, is a man who uses a wheelchair and eight is, is really just bedridden, six is one walking stick, et cetera. And, and so we, we try to assess men as best we can using the scale. Um, but again, an important cutoff is the six range and the seven range uh, if you're using a wheelchair <coughs> or restricted to a wheelchair, I should say. So let's look at the outcomes. So these are standard outcomes that we use in transplant and or oncology. Uh, the X, a horizontal axis is just time. In this case, it's months, anywhere from uh, zero to uh, 120, which is 10 years. And then this is survival. So at the top, 1.0 is 100% survival. And as you go down on the y-axis, uh, survival falls off. So this is uh, these are kaplan meier curves. We're looking at the probability of survival for all patients, 14 of them, uh, was about 60% in this study. Over in B, we're looking at different sources. They did use bone marrow or they did use cord blood. Uh, uh, for some reason, the core blood patients fared extremely poorly, uh, um, and, and I don't know if they included peripheral blood, but bone marrow had superior survival with 80% of those uh, surviving out 10 years. Okay, so again, let's look at that EDSS, uh, and I told you about that break point of uh, six or six to seven, and this is where it comes from. If you need EDSS less than six, um, so that's um, if we go back, you can see that's this strange disability affects daily routine, but not requiring assistance to walk. Uh, you had an 80% plus survival. If you were equal to six or greater, and there were only five patients, but survival was, was, was dismal or, or you know, significantly less uh, at 20%. So, when we interview men and families prior to heading to down transplant, we focus a lot on this and we describe families what this looks like. Um, you know, it's no guarantee, but we do pay attention to the amount of disability one comes into transplant with because it is important. And as we do more international collaborative studies and get more patients numbers, this data will become more accurate. Um, now we can break out EDSS uh, plus plus minus transplant complications. So if you had an EDSS of less than six without a complication, all patients survived. But if you were uh, greater than six uh, or had a complication, which there were eight patients, you didn't do as well. Survival was only about 20, 25% or so. So again, complications we want to avoid. Uh, and again, uh, being in good shape coming into transplant is always idea, ideal. Um, and so then we can we can look at various uh, aspects of the MRI. This just happens to be a table that looks at the internal capsule of the uh, brain on MRI and whether that was involved. Uh, this is a, a part of the brain um, uh, that um, conduit signals. Uh, the posterior internal capsule uh, is a conduit for signals for motor function uh, and is often affected uh, in more advanced boys and in 
men. And so um, they were just looking at differences, whether or not the structure was involved. Uh, it does turn out to be fairly important. If you have involvement in the internal capsule, your less score uh, was six. If you didn't, it was seven. But your EDSS before transplant was six and a half in this group versus three and a half in uh, the group without internal capsule involvement. So again, because this is a uh, part of the brain, the posterior uh, internal capsule does route the, the motor neuron signals. Um, it's no surprise that the EDSS was higher in this group. Um, so this just gives us some um, now MRI descriptors that we can combine with the uh, physical signs and symptoms of the men to try to get some explanation of, again, why those men with higher uh, EDSS scores, or i.e. that is lower mobility, didn't do as well post-transplant. Uh, and then the final slide is, you know, so these are outcomes. They're not great. Uh, they're not as good as the children. Uh, we have a lot further room for improvement uh, for adults with uh, cerebral disease. And Aaron and I will be discussing why these outcomes look like this. Um, some of the lab-based questions that are going on in, in research labs that are studying ALD and, and transplant is, can we get by with less chemotherapy? Children tolerate chemotherapy very well. Uh, when you're an adult, you tolerate chemotherapy not as well. Uh, and one of the reasons is age. Um, being older doesn't, doesn't help you. Uh, and then questions we're specifically interested in is, uh, can we get cells to engraft the brain faster? And this is a micrograph of microglia cells uh, in an in a ALD mouse as shown here. Um, and to try to speed up that process uh, would be ideal. And then getting more of those cells to the brain. So if we can get more of those uh, corrective cells to the brain faster and sooner, uh, we could have a larger impact on disease. Um, any way you slice it. So those are some of the questions that I think are important uh, for uh, really the field of, of men with cerebral disease going through transplant. Um, and that's where I'm gonna stop with those handful of slides. And I'm gonna really hand it back to Aaron, who's gonna tell us a bit about his story um, and, and condition. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Lund, uh, for sharing that presentation. I know that's very um, useful and important information, and I know that we're going to be going over uh, more things in just a few minutes. So I just I was asked to share just a little bit um, about my own um, infantry with ALS old. I live in Washington State, and I was uh, officially diagnosed with um, AMN um, almost six years ago. But I, I began exhibiting symptoms in my uh, late teens. I was probably 18 or 19 uh, with my earliest symptoms. And then things kind of progressed, showing all of the, uh, what we term kind of the classic symptoms of AMN. Uh, all, you know, mobility issues, leg spasms, you know, some neuropathic pain, uh, bladder and bowel issues, um, all of that. Uh, I, my family has a pretty extensive history of um, ALD and AMN. Um, my grandfather and his brother, uh, my great uncle, uh, they both had AMN. Um, they developed symptoms a little bit later. I think they were each in their 30s when they began developing symptoms. And then their um, descendants, uh, all I, they both had uh, female daughters. And so my grandfather had three daughters, my mother being one of them. And then two of my aunts, they all have the gene mutation on one of their X chromosomes. Um, and um, my, I have two male cousins who uh, as boys, they showed the gene mutation. Um, they're both a little bit younger than me. One of them is still uh, completely asymptomatic. He doesn't even have Addison's disease. And my other cousin um, is in his early 30s and he has had Addison's disease since he was a boy. Um, up until recently, he has been completely asymptomatic, uh, but just in the last couple of months, he has begun developing symptoms in his early 30s. And then finally, um, I did have a second cousin, uh, the a grandson of my great uncle who did develop childhood cerebral adrenal leukodystrophy, and he passed away when he was 12 years old from that. Um, and so they did not 
uh, pursue bone marrow transplant for him. So, so there's been a very extensive family history of, of you know, both ALD and AMN. Um, one of the things that has really interested me about this particular topic is that I feel like even with the family history that I've had and even being, you know, six years since diagnosis, I felt that um, it's never really been made extremely clear to me um, what the what the next steps to pursue are um, if somebody is conclusively developing cerebral disease. Um, you know, what's the next thing that we will do? What what how quickly can we move and and how quickly can we um, you know think about, you know, what is the next step that I want to pursue? And so Dr. Lund and I actually met earlier this week um, to go over some questions that I had for him. And even just in that short dialogue that he and I had together, I felt like I was much better, um, much more knowledgeable about, um, you know, what some of the uh, locations that are doing bone marrow transplant, what they will look at for you. And, um, I just felt like I was a lot better educated about that. Um, and it's something that I think that most men with AMN, um, it's information that we should have because even if we are getting annual MRIs um, and even if we are showing no signs of uh, cerebral involvement, uh, which describes me to date, I feel like you know information is, is uh, power, information is necessary and knowing you know, what we would do if I did show conclusive signs on an MRI of developing cerebral disease, I think is gonna be useful for all of us. So, so the next thing that we're gonna jump into is I just have a few uh, qu uh, further questions for Dr. Lund to address. We will go over these and um, anybody who's on this call is encouraged to um, type in your questions in the chat box. If you have further questions about what we are discussing, please write them down and hopefully he and I will be able to see them and uh, Dr. Lund will be able to address some of those. So, Dr. Lund, do you mind if we jump into some of the questions? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, excellent. So I know that you went into this a little bit in your presentation already, but I think one of the most pertinent questions is, who is a good candidate for bone marrow transplant? I know that you spoke about the EDSS um, score, um, but I know when you and I discussed this earlier in the week, you did mention a few other things that you that you look at to determine who is going to be a good candidate for this type of procedure. Right. So, you know, one of the things we look at is really you want to know the, the physical symptoms of the person. So that's CDSS. You want to know the MRI. You want to know the extent of involvement in uh, in terms of disease. Um, while our LESS score is um, applied to children, we do apply it to adults as well, um, though that's not as heavily focused upon. Um, we also need a health history from adults, as you can come in at a variety of any age from 20 to 50. And, you know, we'd be looking at, do you have lung disease? Do you smoke cigarettes? Uh, do you have heart disease? Um, have you, do you have diabetes? So this gets into adult medicine, um, and, uh, but it's important because uh, as I just showed, these outcomes um, in men aren't as good. And these are some of the factors that play a role. Um, have you had cancer? I mean, that, that certainly could come up. And so all those things play a role in predicting outcome. We would then, um, the other things I would look at is um, the MRI. We do a spinal tap, but I look at some of the markers in the spinal fluid because I think those are helpful for predicting outcome, uh, but that's just my prerogative. Um, but we also look at the, the potential donors. Is there a sibling donor? Is there alternatively a matched unrelated donor on the country or is there a cord blood unit? What is the matching level? Um, what is the cell dose of the cord blood unit, uh, if that's what we have to go with? What is our current protocol? Um, all of those things uh, really go into the equation. It's not just one thing. Um, I know people tend to get pretty focused on the last score, um, um, which is two in children as well, but it's not just one thing. You have to put it all together. And then it's a frank conversation with your transplanter 
uh, about all those risk factors, about what life might look like on the other side of transplant and what the odds of survival are. Um, so that that's kind of our approach. I'm a, so as, as many people know, I'm a pediatric transplanter and this is, we're talking about adults. Our age limit is about 25 at our hospital and it, it changes hospital to hospital. Um, so I bring in my adult transplant uh, team uh, once we've decided to go down to the road to transplant. So I serve as the leukodystrophy expert, but the adult transplant team does the full medical assessment and talks about all those um, different risk factors. And we had a question in the chat box about do all transplant center do all center do all transplant centers transplant adults or is it a specialty? It is, it is clearly a, a specialty, and it's it's a separate board certification. Either um, I think less centers transplant adults than they do boys for sure. Um, because there's risk, as I've shown the data on the slides a few moments ago, the transplants aren't as easy and uh, there's definitely more risk and um, some centers just avoid them altogether uh, because um, they're less risk tolerant. So uh, hopefully that answers that uh, question in the box. Yeah. Um, how, many, uh, how many transplant centers uh, do you know of around the US that that would do a transplant for a man with AMN who was a good candidate? Um, so it's, it's a transplant for a man with cerebral disease because um, just AMN by itself is not an indication. Um, and, and so we don't even think transplant affects AMN actually. The AMN component is more peripheral and doesn't necessarily need to have brain involvement. So uh, we, when we talk about transplant in today's boot camp, it really is about a man with cerebral ALD. Now, most often they do have coexisting AMN, uh, so it makes the exam very difficult. Um, but for cerebral disease, there are probably only two to three large centers that would perform such a transplant. Um, uh, if the patient is is in good shape, and so and since it's not commonly done, it's still case by case basis, and our ALD group of experts, you know, we all keep in touch with each other pretty closely when patients come up um, to make sure everybody is is on the same page and discussing things. Sure. Yeah, and I thank you very much for clarifying. I apologize. I, I misspoke um, by saying AMN. I did indeed mean. Uh, a man who's developing cerebral ALD. So thank you very much for clarifying that because I think that is very important. Um, how quickly uh, can a bone marrow transplant be pursued for a man who's a good candidate? Say if um, you know a patient had an MRI that showed conclusive signs of developing cerebral disease, but they were otherwise a good candidate for pursuing bone marrow transplant, how quickly can it be done? What is um, you know, how long does it take to find a donor um, to, to set it up? How, how far out is it, is it being scheduled, generally speaking? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, I think once we've committed down the road, you can do the matching of uh, the patient with any brothers and sisters in about 10 days. Um, at the same time, you're trying to do that matching. Once you've uh, HLA typed the patient, and we wanna do like a national search through Be The Match, that also takes 10 days. And that, this can be done at the same time. Um, so you can have bro both processes. Uh, if you find a brother or sister that's a match, you can proceed to transplant probably two weeks after that. So that time course is roughly three, four weeks. So that you can move pretty fast uh, for a brother and, or sister match. If you don't have that and you have to move to an unrelated, uh, if you have to move to umbilical cord blood, uh, that can go as fast, that can go about as fast as well because the, that unit is frozen in a freezer somewhere and we just need it shipped. That's all we need to do is check the unit, get it shipped. And, and so that goes faster. 
if it's a, a be the match unrelated donor or a person somewhere out in the country of the world that's going to donate, that takes more coordination because that person has to be a notified that they signed up for this 10 years ago uh, and now we're ready to do a transplant. They have to take time off of work. Um, they have to go through a physical exam to make sure they're still healthy. They have to still be willing to donate. Um, and so on the donor's end, there's coordination. And so that time frame tends to be a little longer. We're looking at uh, six to eight weeks on that, um, depending on you know what country they're in and, and what's going on in their lives. So, but that's about the rough time frame it takes to, to go from uh, committing to transplant to doing it. And then the, the actual um, procedure itself, along with recovery time, um, I, personally, I am not familiar with it, with what the procedure itself involves, how long mm -hmm. that takes, and what is the recovery time like after that? Right. Uh, the procedure itself for the uh, recipient is there's, uh, you know, you make the decision we're going to do this, and then usually there's some intervening period where, you know, for us, our referrals are from all over the country, so the family, the patient will go home. Um, and um, kind of get things set up. They'll return to us for like a workup week where we'll do a full physical exam. We'll do, um, we'll assess heart, kidney, lungs. Uh, this process takes three to four days. Um, it's just really to make sure every, the patient's in A1 shape going forward. Uh, very close to that is uh, we have to put in a, a, a central line, which is an IV that goes into a large vessel near the heart that takes a day. And the next day after that is uh, when we start chemo. So that chemo takes about a week or so. Let's, we'll just round it off to a week. So, uh, so we have a workup and then we have chemo. Uh, the chemo is in the hospital. So now we're two weeks into this. And then uh, right after chemo is transplant day. We call it J0. Um, that's when the cells get infused, whether it's a brother or sister cells or whether it's a cord blood or an unrelated donor, the cells are infused. That, that takes 30 minutes to 120 minutes. That's it's, uh, less eventful than people think. It's just a bag that gets hung and it goes in through the IV and then it's done. Um, and then at that time, your immune system is pretty much zero. So you need immune system recovery. That process takes about four weeks in the hospital. So, uh, and that's uh, having no complications and everything goes perfectly. So now I've got that week of chemo plus four weeks in the hospital, that equals five weeks total in the hospital. And then once you're discharged from the hospital, you're discharged to a, a, a facility where you're living with a, usually a caregiver to help get you to clinic because you just don't leave you. You then come to clinic uh, every day and then every other day and just to keep an eye on you. Um, and, and so that process for our system and uh, the way we practice, uh, we require two to three months in the Twin Cities. And that, I think that's pretty common. So we like patients to stay in the Twin Cities for 100 days after their transplant. And then they can go back home and where we hand off care to a local, usually an oncologist, because they know kind of what we're doing and can help us. Um, and so we tell families uh, plan to spend at least four months in the Twin Cities. Um, and this is true of a child or an adult. Um, and, and so that's kind of the, the whole process. And again, barring no complications, no problems, no hiccups, et cetera. Um, that could change the entire timeline. So it's a major commitment in life. Um, you know, you're, you're moving to your transplant center for a short period. You know, you've established housing uh, and, and kind of picking things up. Uh, people do try to work, work remotely and, and some are very successful at it. Um, other jobs are, are less able to be moved, but uh, that's, that's some rough timelines uh, on, and guidance. Yeah. Yeah, that's very that's very helpful information as well. Um, this is this is a little bit uh, of a more difficult question. Um, in your, your familiarity with um, the disease process, uh, for those men who 
either are not able to pursue bone marrow transplant or uh, choose not to go that route, um, or to speak at all about expected outcomes. Um, I, I mean, I know that this is this is a, a difficult subject, but um, you know, what are what do you see for prognosis um, if if you have information on that? Yeah, it's a, it's a lot harder to answer if you're not going through transplant um, because in the past, we just haven't kept track of anybody. In fact, making the diagnosis is becoming more common than it used to be because we're more familiar with things and genetic testing is available. But in the past, you'd have a man in a wheelchair, perhaps, who's been diagnosed with some disease, maybe it's MS, maybe it's something else, uh, but then just deteriorates and ends up being diagnosed with a progressive form of dementia and passes away. So uh, we would have never known about AMN or cerebral ALD. Uh, so our best guess is really from the limited experience now watching some men and often we think it's progressive within five years, uh, certainly, but I wouldn't ever guarantee that to a person. Um, a lot of it, it depends on how much life support a person is on, et cetera, things like that. Um, you know, there's, you know, in, in theory, oh, one can be alive an extremely long time uh, uh, on uh, um, extreme medical support. I mean, you have machines that can clean your blood, to breathe for you, et cetera. So that so-called um, uh, length of time of life is hardly, used, is hardly as useful now, is that good quality of life? Um, most people would argue no, um, but I would definitely say deter expect deterioration within five years once cerebral disease has, has started. But you could probably ask any of the ALD experts um, around and might and probably get a slightly different answer. Um, but again, it's it's you know based kind of on our each individual experiment uh, experience. So that's uh, our best guess. Cool. Absolutely. Um, are there any other steps that can be taken outside of bone marrow transplant, to your knowledge, uh, after a diagnosis of cerebral disease, um, to to try to make a difference? Um, medical wise, I don't believe there are any. Uh, you know, if you're talking about some other IV medicine or pill. I don't think so. I've encountered a number of, of men with cerebral disease and some we can't take to transplant. Um, you know, there, there's a variety of antioxidants that are out there um, that I, I tell families or patients, you know, they, they usually just want to try to do something to change their life or, you know, instead of, instead of, doing nothing, they, they want to be more active. And I, I kind of give them a list of, you know, here's some antioxidants. We know that the disease involves oxidative stress um, and maybe these antioxidants can help. There's really not a lot of uh, evidence behind it. And I can't say that somebody's going to get up and walk because they're taking antioxidants, but it, 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 uh, it potentially, it doesn't hurt. Um, they're all mostly vitamin based. There's N acetylcysteine and alpha lipoic acid and vitamin D. Um, and, and so this is what I've given uh, patients recommendations on because I don't have um, like a solid take this pill and things will be better or be fine or take this IV because I don't have that. So most of my discussions are when I'm asked, Dr. Lund, is there anything I can do at all? I say, you know, we, you could try these things and then, you know, stay as healthy as possible, exercise, stretch, et cetera, all those things. Okay. That's great. Um, yeah, thank you very much for answering those questions. I, I believe we have about 15 minutes left in this session. Um, I wanna look at some of the questions that other people have sent in. Um, I'm gonna try to do that, just one moment. Um, Let's see. Are you are you still able to hear me, uh, Dr. Lund? Yes. Yep. Okay. One of the questions that was asked was: Should myself and or others plan on getting a bone marrow transplant 
soon or down the line, even if demyelination in the brain stopped and I'm getting yearly MRIs saying the patient is stable. So it sounds like they're saying there were signs of cerebral disease, but they have not, they haven't changed or progressed. Mm -hmm. And it, it looks like things are stable. Yeah, and it's a situation that's not uncommon actually is that um, you know, not all men are getting MRIs and then something changes, they get an MRI or they've forgotten to get MRIs and then they get a new one and you'll see these findings. And so typically if it's non-active disease, um, we don't take a man to transplant. If it's just stable disease um, that isn't moving anywhere, we just more or less leave it alone. If we do see active inflammation, such as uh, gadolinium enhancement is really what we're looking for. If we see that, we are kind of more of a, in a hurry up mode uh, and counsel families that, you know, the ideal time, uh, it, that's when the ideal, ideal time is to go to transplant when you have active inflammation noted on the, on the MRI. Um, you know, it's still, again, a, a rare process, so it's a case-by-case -case discussion, but, you know, if it's somebody with no gadolinium enhancement and the MRI just shows a history of brain disease, but it's currently stable, then I, I wouldn't make a transplant recommendation. Sure. Um, this is actually, this actually kind of sparked a, a question that I had. I know that you mentioned that, um, you know, outcomes are usually better for in the case of children um, than they are for men. I'm I'm curious as to um, why bone marrow transplant is not just considered a standard um, a standard of care. I, I suppose when um, a, a male uh, infant has been diagnosed with the gene mutation that causes ALD performed across the board. I don't, I don't know if that question makes sense. Um, you mean in a, in a man or a child? In a, in a child. So if I, if I showed as a child that I had the gene mutation and maybe, you know, I, I didn't show any signs of cerebral disease as a child, maybe I only had Addison's disease as my only symptom at that point. And we, you know, we have no indication of whether it was going to manifest as a, a cerebral ALD phenotype or as an AMN phenotype. Um, why not just pursue bone marrow transplant at, at that point if there are, if there are better mm -hmm. outcomes? And I'm, I'm probably showing my ignorance because I realize that this is a, a very complicated and um, yeah. medical procedure, but yeah, no, hopefully no, that I question yeah, another question comes up, and we discuss it at, our, at conferences and, and things like that. Uh, there's a couple of reasons. One is um, the transplant inherently is a, still a fairly toxic process. You're infusing somebody with extremely high doses of essentially poison to the bone marrow and poison to the microglia cells of the brain. Um, and, and that's busulfan. Uh, we used to use radiation, uh, but we don't use that anymore. Uh, and so there's still a risk of dying from transplant. And that overall risk is 10%. Um, so um, given that that's the, the process you have to go through and there's significant risk, now there's more risk in adults even, um, we don't offer transplant to any, anybody that just has the mutation. Um, uh, just because of that risk is that we'd be transplanting um, uh, children and some of them would lose their lives just from the process. And I'll, I'll just remind you that uh, only 40% of children convert on their brain MRI. So potentially we'd be transplanting 60% that won't have any conversion on their brain um, and, won't, and would not need a transplant. Uh, and so for those reasons, um, we don't transplant just prophylactically. Uh, if you will. And there's some reason to believe, I, I'm not even, would that work? Would that be enough? I, I don't even know. Because again, the triggers for cerebral disease are f just very poorly understood. We, we, we hardly understand uh, the, the, the triggers for most men or children. Well, that's a, that's a great answer.
Um, I'm going back to the chat really quick to look at other questions that have been shared. Um, somebody asked, do all transplant centers transplant adults or is it a specialty? Uh, so are there centers that only do transplants for boys? Right, I tried to get at the a, lo a little bit earlier is that the adult transplant is a different medicine. So it's a, it is a specialty, uh, but given the nature and the risk behind the transplant, a lot of centers avoid it because um, they're, they're used to um, uh, transplant for leukemia, multiple myeloma, some of the more standard uh, indications. When it comes to a leukodystrophy in adult, um, you, you don't have a lot of centers that'll do it. Um, ours is one and there are a few others. So uh, that, that becomes a much smaller window uh, as opposed to pediatric transplants, which I think more centers will do boys because uh, they're younger and outcomes are better. Okay. Um, another question that we had uh, is, how likely does cerebral disease happen in men over 50? Um, I'm just kind of speaking anecdotally, but I know from conversations that I've had with other men with AMS, something that many of us have been, have been told um, over the course of our illness is that there is a, um, there's a little bit of guesswork that possibly as you get older, um, if, if you're just showing the, the symptoms of sort of classic AMN, um, that there is less risk of you developing cerebral disease the older that you get. And some other people have shared, it's, there may be finding that that actually is not true. Um, that, you know, that's something that doctors had possibly thought for a while, but it may not be. Is there anything that you can speak to that? Does, does there show any signs of like there being less risk of developing cerebral disease as you age? Um, I don't, it's really hard to answer that. We'd all be guessing. You know, there, there are, you know, a lot of us that work in this field, um, Mark Englund, Florian Eichler, Stefan Kemp, and others have tried to put together a timeline. Um, there's some suggestion that, you know, everybody's at risk. And if you live till 90 or 100, you're still at risk for cerebral disease. And, and, and if you live long enough, um, maybe eventually you'll get, you'll get it. Um, the problem with predicting it is we don't know how many people with AMN there are. Uh, again, going back to a man in a wheelchair for unknown reasons or unknown diagnosis or an MS diagnosis, there could be lots of those men uh, in that denominator. So uh, it's almost impossible to know. Um, so I guess what I can say is, you know, if we encounter a man and or a family, we just recommend looking at MRIs uh, yearly and uh, you know, in the last five or 10 years, since we're all monitoring uh, patients and we're now much more connected thanks to groups like ALD Connect, that we can better predict this going forward. But historically, it's, it's almost impossible. So I'd say a man is always at risk. I, I don't think it ever goes up or goes down. Um, there's a question about triggers for men. And, and again, it's largely unknown. Is age a trigger? I'm not sure. It, it could be. We do think um, that trauma could be a trigger. And this could be um, a blow to the head, uh, certainly been described in children. Uh, I've certainly seen children that have been in a car accident and then diagnosed with cerebral disease a little bit later. Uh, and so that that's disruptive. Medical trauma as well. I've seen children get brain biopsies uh, to understand the lesion in their brain. And then that ignited a whole bunch of active inflammation. I've seen that two or three times now, uh, but medical trauma could also include um, something like an MI, a heart attack. I think anything that puts massive amounts of stress on the brain um, in, that, in that medical fashion could be a trigger. So um, outside of that, um, uh, I don't know if there's a specific, uh, anything else that's specific, like a certain infection, like is influenza trigger? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I did see a, a young boy diagnosed with cerebral disease a little bit after um, COVID. Uh, 
actually at COVID four months prior. And so are those true to unrelated? Not sure, but um, he was sick with COVID and then developed cerebral disease. Some of these things, um, again, will take time to work out through registries and whatnot. Sure. Um, it looks like we have about five minutes left. So I just want to encourage if anybody has any other questions, we do have time uh, to answer a few other questions in the chat box. Um, one of the other questions that was asked is, um, children, uh, I, the question is why MRIs yearly for men with AMN, um, or I suppose men developing cerebral disease and not twice a year as in children. Um, is, your, is your recommendation for men with AMN to receive an MRI once a year? Yeah, my, mine is once a year. Uh, it has to do with kind of that peak window of cerebral conversion uh, through all the historical work and research. We know that that age is about seven or so. Uh, and, that, and that's the peak. And then it tapers off. So um, whether or not it picks up later in life is open to debate. But the peak is still seven years of age. And so that window from about three to 12 is when we're getting MRIs twice a year. And then after that, um, we go to yearly uh, for any person with ALD, unless some, there's some other circumstance. Um, and that includes men. There's a question about if, if there's white matter and, and are there treat, are, if, I assume that means if there are no treatments to slow progression, why get MRIs? Um, I think one of the reasons is treat, I think there are companies developing drugs and treatments. Um, everyone has probably heard of Minarex by now for AMN. Uh, there may be some theoretical impact on cerebral disease. We don't know. There are other companies very interested in, in disease of men. Um, there is the ability for transplant. So uh, I'd rather have the yearly information from an MRI than not have it. Um, and so I'll continue to encourage uh, men to get their MRI every year, um, even if it's stable. Sometimes that's helpful to know. Um, this, is, this is a really interesting question um, in the Q&A uh, box. Is the quality of the MRI ever a limitation in making a decision about transplants? Is there anything that we or our local doctors can do better with our yearly MRIs to make sure they are as useful as possible? Um, yeah, well, quality is, is, comes into question only if gadolinium hasn't been used. I mean, if you wanna get into sequences and magnet strengths and you know how many uh, Tesla's is it one or three? It's usually fine. Um, I, I we prefer MRIs with gadolinium to look for enhancements. So most machines uh, can do it and and do a reasonable job as long as the person's not moving. Um, that's the main artifact we'll deal with. We deal with as physicians is motion artifact. But otherwise, uh, ninety percent of the MRIs I look at are are pretty good. I see uh, okay. uh, another question so on the, before. It sounds like. I, was gonna say, I see a question on, do you wait and see if cerebral disease halts on its own? And it's a tricky question to answer. Um, I don't. Uh, I set things in motion if it's got inflammation. I don't wait to see if it halts on its own with any person, child or man. Um, when you're an adult, of course, you can make, you can look at the survival curves and I go over those curves with patients and we make an informed decision together and a, an adult can decide, you know, I, that adult may not want to undertake the transplant risk. Maybe they have a, you know, maybe they smoke six packs of cigarettes a day today and uh, a day and have emphysema and their risks are really high of not making it. And maybe they want to not address it with transplant. Um, and so uh, when you're an adult, you, you have that um, ability uh, to say, listen, I, I'm, I'm going to go this other route and, and not take the transplant route. 
with children, when they have, you know, demyelinating active disease, it's harder to say, let's just wait and see if this is self-arrest because for a child, their brain is still development, they, in development. They have potential to gain IQ points and intelligence. And the longer you wait, the more deterioration that's happening because it's a constant process. I think there was one medications in trial for people with AMN. Is there any hope there for the future? I believe you spoke a little bit about the, the Minorex uh, trial um, that has been happening and I, I believe is still ongoing. I think, um, mm -hmm. I believe that all the men are now on the actual drug and no longer on a placebo, if I'm not mistaken. Do you, do you know of anything else? Uh, yeah, there are several other companies, uh, a handful of them that are actively interested in, in having products being pushed forward and are in development to treat men with ALD. Um, and in fact, there's going to be uh, a panel later uh, uh, discussing some of these things um, in, at two o'clock Eastern, there's gonna be looking ahead at industry pipeline uh, in which uh, we'll hear more details about those uh, companies and what they're doing. So I'm as optimistic today as I've ever been uh, given the interactions and the, and the drug development that's ongoing. So I hope it keeps going and we'll have, and we'll have more drugs uh, in the future than ever. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a wonderful segue into what will be one of the later sessions in the day. So I believe we are uh, just about out of time right now. I just wanted to say thank you so much, Dr. Lund, for, um, for your slide presentation and just answering some of these questions that are um, a lot more pertinent to uh, those of us men who have AMN, who have concerns about the potential for developing cerebral disease in the future. I think that this is going to be extremely beneficial. Um, for, for people to refer back to as well. So thank you so much for your time and sharing your knowledge and your expertise on this uh, topic. Great, you're very welcome. I'm, I'm also looking forward to hearing the, the rest of the day, so. Excellent, thank you very much. We look forward yeah. to seeing everybody else in the rest of the sessions and uh, we will sign out of this one in just a moment. All right.